Um, the, the, uh, I think let's just unambiguously refer to that as the load hook. Um, yes. Where only use the term import when it also initializes. That's right. Yeah, I I feel pretty strongly about that too. Um, yeah, this 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 uh, in <laughs> in order to not presume that consensus existed on that issue already when I read, wrote the slides, I, um, I I left it as import hook so that there was some clarity. But I do think so uh, that we should should. Uh, does anybody object to renaming import hook to load hook? Um, in the future, or going forward, at least in the scope of this con conversation, I think it's clarifying. Okay, cool. Um, uh, I will point out and replace import hook on these slides live, uh, and, and I'll go back and edit well, them later. You you said something that was a bit confusing to me. You said the referrer is different. Yes. Through uh, a redirect. Yes. Is that is not currently how we implement it. Uh, the, um, the, the purpose, um, I don't wish to overload. Uh, so Bradley, you're referring to the distinction between, um, you're, you're referring to the distinguish, the, the, uh, a distinction between the module specifier as requested and the module specifier as obtained. Um, um, I, well, I, I guess, but Really, it's about the uh, nature of, is this an atomic operation? Uh, if, if we do this route of redirects where you intercept each redirect, it is not an atomic operation. So currently, whenever we go through a load uh, in node, um, we must resolve to a full path. We can't resolve to a redirect that is re-entering on the loader. Is this, uh, as I understand it, uh, able to be re-entrant? It's not. The expectation is that you return, uh, that you must return in your, you know, from, from the, the load hook must return, not just, it must return both the information of the redirect and the uh, and the static module record of the module that you were redirected to, it can't it cannot result in a, in a reentrance into the load hook. Okay, so that that was my primary concern, and then it seems like if you supply compartment, you cannot supply specifier. No, they are not mutually exclusive, um, and and I only had compartment for completeness. We didn't need it. Because if well, if you specify both, that seems a bit confusing. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, that the specifier in the target compartment. I I I, um, I will uh, find out what the escape button is on this computer, um, and I I think that this. Yeah, that seems fine. We and actually I, had an older uh, spec for our loaders that effectively did this. So that's yeah. actually kind of nice to see. Uh, we had specifier be optional originally in that. And then after designs, we made it not optional. We never shipped that API, but uh, yeah. How do you solve the problem without, uh, how do you solve the problem of nodes redirect? Um, for in in I mean there are other cases I know like symbolic links or HTTP redirects but just for example how do you do the name to name slash index.js today? Uh, so that's done during resolution, and resolution is done uh, prior to evaluation, prior to parsing even. Mm -hmm. um, and so here you would perform resolution, and that is how you obtain your static module. And then you must provide the absolute uh, URL in our case, uh, which is effectively the full specifier. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is that? some okay. normalization that Node does on that actually. When you provide a uh, the 
absolute URL, it does real pathing by default. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and real path is IO. So it has to be, well, it doesn't have to be async, but it should be. Uh, it is currently not async. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. uh, when we benchmarked it, it was actually faster a of while course. ago. It of course, of course. Yeah, I, I, I remember having a conversation with Brian Cantrell um, uh, at a conference and, and uh, one of the points that he made was, well, at that time it was still, uh, there was still it was still raw that CommonJS was adopted by Node and the, the downside purportedly was that CommonJS at least appears to be a synchronous API and by node is implemented as a, as a synchronous API. Um, and the downside of that is uh, sure some, there's some web portability issues, or at least it was perceived as a time to be limiting web portability and Brian's, uh, Brian's take on this because Brian's going from a systems programming, per, uh, this was Ryan Dahl's boss at the time. If, um, and, uh, at joint and, uh, his point was, well, you're never going to asynchronously dynamically load a, a, <laughs> um, a, a, a dynamic library. So what's the point in worrying about it? <laughs> yeah, so we actually do have an outstanding issue with upgrades to move stuff to asynchronous uh, forms. Mm -hmm. But uh, the cost of crossing the C++ barrier until recently, it was just too drastic to ever think of using asynchronous programming because you cross the barrier more often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, it, I, I think that that is fine as an optimization. It certainly is not contrary to the spirit of the thing. The, as long as the compartment API allows you to make that choice by um, allowing for the load hook to be async. Um, the, the problem is that the resolve hook must be synchronous, but I don't think that that's actually a problem because node, um, the node resolver is something that takes place underneath the locate uh, phase uh, uh, within so, the load book. So our resolve actually has an asynchronous contract. Yes. Uh, and you can do asynchronous operations. It's just the default implementation is always synchronous. Yeah. Uh, well, what, what I'm suggesting is that the resolve hook as proposed for in the compartment API is synchronous, but it is not the same thing as the, the as the resolve function in in node correct yes um, and that if you uh, there's certainly no harm in doing a logical resolution before doing a io based location um, like i i would call nodes um, resolve hook to locate in the context of the compartment api sure um, what is the what are the arguments to import hook? Uh, import hook only receives a full specifier. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's it sounds like this is this is um, the, it sounds like there wouldn't that this would not meet objections um, introducing this the this aliasing feature. Um, All right, uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll create the issue and, and, um, and eventually get around to writing a PR for this, uh, this change to the API. Um, okay, global lexicals. This one is going to be long and tedious, I suspect. <laughs> the, um, so the motivator, the motivation for this proposal is that at Agoric, we needed a way um, to introduce lexically scoped variables into a compartment that were, not, uh, that were not discoverable by enumerating the properties of the global object. Um, and the reason for this is, to in, is in order to create metering in, in our particular case. The metering is uh, metering is a similar use case to um, instrumentation um, uh, through through a code transform. Uh, so, so, and because that's more familiar, I'll describe that instead of metering. Um, 
So uh, if you were using a tool like NYC with Istanbul um, to do code coverage analysis of a program, you would do that by doing two things. With the compartment API, you would do that with two things. One would be by introducing, um, by for, for, for one, uh, introducing a global, uh, in, introducing an object in the scope of every module that is a dumping ground where uh, coverage information can be recorded by the text of that module. And then you would introduce a transform that converts every expression and statement into um, uh, a, a first, first record I got here on that global object um, and then execute the, the, the expression that was actually intended. Um, and uh, it, like using the comma operator, for example. And uh, that, is, that is sufficiently, that particular use case is sufficiently served by adding a coverage object to the global list of the compartment. Metering, on the other hand, is not, is, is very similar in the case, in, because that they're, you're adding, you are in a transform, code transform, introducing statements that record, I got here, so that uh, so that those uh, so that execution can be halted um, if it runs too long. Um, the but the tr the problem with that approach is that for metering that global object must not be tamper discoverable or tamperable by the program that is under metering. Um, and in order to do that, it was necessary for us to introduce it as a lexically scoped variable that is not discoverable on the global object. Um, and we did that by creating an inner scope around uh, the global this. Um, so uh, I say on this last bullet point necessary for REPLs, uh, which is not actually correct. Um, this, is, this is no longer true. What's necessary for REPLs is a similar feature, but not the same. Um, REPLs uh, have this rule that if you do successive evaluation in sloppy mode, um, that any constants that are declared by a previous eval are preserved for a subsequent eval. Um, this was previously discussed, I believe, uh, pre pre in, in previous conversations with TC39, that was called the global contour, which is a name that everybody hates, but is the, the handle that sticks for now and is distinct from global lexicals. Well, um, we say it is distinct from global lexicals. It uh, is potentially. <laughs> okay. What we're, what we're proposing uh, is only one concept. We're proposing to support global lexicals by supporting the global contract, correct? Right? Um, possibly. It is. Uh, the, the, diff, uh, the shim. It, they, they, there yeah. is, I, I have I not that, fully reasoned whether they can be reconciled. Okay. I know that the shim right now doesn't support the global con contour, but everything about the way it supports global lexicals, I believe is all necessary uh, in, uh, in order to support the global contour. And I, I would certainly object to introducing two, um, two such odd concepts. One uh, such odd concept is unavoidable because it's in the language as it exists right now, and in order for departments to fit with the full language outside of SES, we need to support the global countries. Uh, and really, um, you know, I would consider it really, really quite terrible if we found we could not do what we needed to do with global lexicals using the global contour mechanism. I agree completely. I, I just cannot propose that at this time since I have not reasoned through what it would take to re reconcile the two. Um, okay. to, to get there, I think that we need to figure out um, for all of the possible modes of evaluation and for all of the possible modes of, uh, of loading mo of module contexts, um, is there a single concept that, that, that spans all of those things? And mm -hmm. so, one of the th one of the problems is that the global contour is mutable by eval, um, which I think is undesirable. It would be undesirable for the for that glo uh, for the for, for this mutable global contour to also be used in a module namespace. Um, I I don't think that we want to create a system where introducing a const by running compartment evaluate 
introduces a value in the scope of modules in the same compartment. Um, and that, that in particular might put a wrench in using the same object for both. Okay, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, is that the global contour as currently specified does have this horrible hazard that we, that we cannot allow um, that module A adding a variable to the global contour changes the behavior of module B because module A's additional variable can shadow what would have been a global binding of the same name. Chip, you're muted. Chip, you're muted. I think Chip is deliberately muted. Um, <laughs> yes, I was, I was uh, saying something to my son. Uh, <laughs> about household yeah. So oh. I'm, I'm not clear on the, the first claim that, um, that putting something on the global object would be discoverable in a way that uh, introducing lexical values is not. Because yes. eval, eval inside the compartment could still discover the lexical values, could it not? Uh, no, because we do this in, uh, because the transform that we use censors use of that name. Um, uh, basically- By overriding eval, among other things? Uh, it does, yeah. does it? it? It would have to, it's, it's um, in, since the transform, the, the metering transform is a mandatory transform. Uh, it can't allow the, if the source code fed into the transform says, evaluate computed string, uh, obviously the enforcement that only transform code runs cannot allow that call to eval to be an end run around the transform. Right, so, so the transform, the code that is introduced that references the, uh, the introduced lexical would have to have some kind of privileged access that the, that the transformed source code does not have. It, it has basically like the, the transform code would need a restricted eval basically that is um, where, where a less restricted eval is available to the introduced code, correct? The, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit lost in the, in the different distinction. Uh, okay, so, so the, the example we're looking at here, it introduces like const foo, and let's just, let's just run with that. Okay. So if I have source code that says uh, eval type of like oh, a string, oh, concat oh. string concatenation f plus o plus o, like I, I can now access this lexical value. Yes, the, 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 the workaround for that is that every, all code that is in this compartment is subject to the transform that is supplied at component compartment construction, uh, construction including the computed code that you feed back to eval. Um, so, so the sensor, even though you have computed a value, the sensor would still, still, still see the text and forbid it. Um, right, because you're overriding eval. Yes, because compartments have compart because every compartment has an overridden eval. Yes, but but that also means that in order for the introduced code to access foo, it has to have something that isn't available to the uh, to the transformed source code. Uh, yes. What, I'm sorry, what, I'm sorry, which code is the introduced code? That's what that's what I'm going to ask. The the metering code, let's say, the the code that should be able to access foo. Yes, must the, have access to something that yes. the, that the uh, transform source code does not have. Right. But now it seems circular because that's what you were trying to do in the first place. Yes, the transform does two things. One is it censors the input text and produces output text that contains the named variable. Um, but, but if you can do that, then you don't need this. It, do, you uh, under, do you understand the circularity that I'm... The, the, the problem is the difference between uh, computed code versus computed property lookup. Uh, we can, we can, we feel like we can afford in these scenarios to replace eval with a transforming eval. Uh, we cannot afford to, in that rewrite, replace 
uh, all square bracket computed property lookups uh, with something that checks the property name. No, no, I, I get that, but if you if you replace the eval, yeah, with a you know with a, a a form that will do the censoring, yeah, then what is how is the other code accessing the new lexical? Is so it just is, as which, is, which it just is the directly? Other, I'm getting I'm getting lost in pronouns again. Name, name the pieces of the code. So I was I was using. Um, Transformed and introduced. Does that work? No. Okay. Uh, transformed. transformed. Okay. Introduced is, is the one that's provided by the by the client, and transformed is provided by the metering transform. Got it. Uh, okay. okay. No, that's actually backwards. Then. Um, how about privileged and unprivileged? Uh, okay. So privileged is the code that is produced by the metering transform. Unprivileged is the input to the metering transform. Yes, I think I think we have three kinds of code. There's the code that goes into the metering transform. There's the code that comes out of the metering metering transform, and there's the code that uh, uh, runs directly without having gone through the metering transform. Can say things that you couldn't have said simply as a result of going through the transform. And that's the privileged code. The metering transform itself is producing code that uses privilege, but it's, it's, it's doing that in order to impose a constraint, not in order to exercise privilege. Yeah, and it's the constraint that I'm getting at. Okay. So the, man, we need terms here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the code that goes into the metering transform, uh, let's call that user code. Okay. Um, the code that comes out of the metering transform, let's call that transformed code. And the code that runs without having gone through the metering transform, uh, let's call that privileged code. Okay, so we have uh, user code, transformed code, privileged code, and yes. what actually gets evaluated is the union of privileged code and transformed code. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So the, the privileged code can access foo, no, no problem. That, that's its whole, that is its privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. The transformed code is prohibited from accessing foo, but it does have an eval into which no, it no, can no. send. No, 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 no. The user code is prohibited from naming foo. The transformed code, uh, the, the transformation inserts a reference only for purposes of doing what the transformation is doing. So the, the idea is that the, the, where, the, you know, where the foo is the, 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 the metering hook. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea is that the transformation introduces a reference to foo but it's one that is um, not one that the user code could have mentioned. Right. So if the user if the user code mentioned foo, that would be you know censored away or somehow fail or or redirected. You know the the user code referencing foo doesn't get the same foo. Definitely doesn't get the same foo as the privileged code. Right. Yeah, let's let's just deal with the simple case. It's not fully transparent, but it's simpler to reason about and adequate. Uh, where foo is spelled very funny, you know, dollar h underbar whatever, um, yep. and that uh, if the user code mentions it, then the user code is statically rejected. Sure. So, uh, but the user code can also reference eval, you know, combination yep. string concat of f o and o, for instance. That's right. Uh, and in the transformed code, the input to um, what was in the user code input to eval is subject itself to uh, to dynamic transformation, right? Right. The eval that the user code has available to it is a it is an eval that accepts user code, transforms it, and then causes the transformed code to evaluate. Perfect. So, so given that, um, 
if the user code references either the the foo variable directly or the the post transformation well actually so we said it rejects it so if user code references foo is just rejected outright um, That's correct. and that that protects it enough that only the only the privilege code has access to it right okay. and the key th the key thing there is that for a global i'm going to use global lexical and variable and global contour synonymously here um, but there, as, as, as previously mentioned, there is an issue we need to come back to. But uh, the, key the key invariant is that for a global lexical variable, a evaluate, an evaluated source code text can only access it by naming it. it so, right. it's, so you can statically censor it. Whereas a global variable, i.e. a variable that's alias to a property on the global object, uh, can be accessed by computed property name lookup. And to censor that by transformation would require rewriting all computed property lookups, which we definitely want to avoid. Agreed. I, I definitely see you know, the need for uh, lexical injection. OK. Thanks. OK. Um, I think that we've covered this. I'll create an issue. But it sounds like, in general, there are no objections to this. Um, uh, well, there, there's, there's the open issue yes. that of reconciling global lexicals with global contour. And global contour, the weird hazard that I haven't paid enough attention to is that module A adding a global lexical can cause module B dynamically even to change its behavior because now the, the introduced lexical can shadow uh, a global variable that module B had been referring to. Yeah, and there's also the matter that the global contour, um, the global contour in a module um, does not have the same, it, 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 it might be necessary, in order to do this, it might be necessary to introduce another, another con layer of contour in the scope of modules because it is simply not possible um, to have an evaluate expression, say const foo, that may or may not collide with an existing const foo in any of the modules in that system. Um, so in order for that to be sensible, it would have to be injected in a scope that is higher than the global, than, than, than the scope in which consts are, 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 are placed inside of, inside of a module. Uh, Chip, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just, just before you moved on, um, is there some significance to the dagger character in the uh, bottom code example, bottom line code example? Let me see. Um, there almost certainly is, <laughs> but that's the problem with not putting the footnote. Uh, global, global, true. Uh, the dagger might be a reminder to me to um, uh, to come back to this and make sure that global true is a, a sensible thing in the context of the current spec. Uh, I I think that I don't. I haven't checked whether it's spelled that way. Um, and oh, it so right now, it's only spell. It's only an explanatory concept in the spec. It's, there's no other place where it shows up as a name in an API that needs to be explained. Uh, and so one of the things we need to be aware of is that when we turn a expo an internal expository spec concept into an API name, uh, the um, understandability of the name choice becomes a much higher priority. Uh, and I think that the global code versus eval code, which is the terminology distinction in the spec, is just terrible. It's just not an understandable piece of terminology for this distinction. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I was I was more concerned about the clarity of the slide. Yeah, the, the intention on this, yeah, the <laughs> I, I clearly need to expand upon this dagger. Uh, um, 
escape should apply to the slide, not to Zoom. Goodness. Um, <laughs> uh. Yeah, one, one opportunity for simplification here that is politically complicated uh, is that um, in a SES machine like Modable is building, um, there is no sloppy mode. Uh, if we also don't support evaluation as global code, we only support evaluation as eval code, then with both, both sloppy and global code off the table, there is no global contour. Okay. Um, I I think that clarifies Chip. Is that is that <laughs> it's just, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. It's, like, it's not part of the source text there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, I think that that's all we can do today. So we'll uh, uh, we can pick up on this next lovely issue um, in in a future presentation. And so the. Uh, Make compartment constructor, make compartment, make compartment, consolidate compartment options bag. Uh, okay, so there's only there are only two more topics. Um, oh yeah, and oh there are three. There are three more topics, <laughs> um, and we can pick up here next time. Uh, uh, what do you think about um, doing this presentation at TC thirty nine coming up? Um, I think that it is not sufficiently polished for that audience. Um, and given that it took this much time, we would have to construct a much more polished and shorter version of this presentation to do that. Um, what I would like to do for the next TC39 is uh, not, I don't think that we can call for advancement. Um, no. uh, I think that we could give a status update. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we could do a status update that is a very compressed version of this. Um, that pertains just to refocusing on the module loader facet of compartments. Um, yeah, and may, maybe, uh, maybe briefly cover the, the structure of CES proposals up front so that it's clear that this is a thin slice of, of yep. what we're proposing for CES. Yeah. Um, yep. and, and focus on the areas that are um, soliciting feedback or for which, well, and um, the areas that refinement to the presentation is probably warranted because that will, the presentation will get feedback from TC39 that can be used to refine it for the one that ultimately requests advancement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the, the upshot of this presentation is that there are a number of unresolved questions. Um, I'd, what I would like to do over uh, bef before we even present progress is uh, I, I get some it, it, to arrive arrive at a, a local consensus of what what uh, path forward we collectively recommend, um, and 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 still present the alternatives because I know the the audience will be interested in the alternatives as well. Um, and uh, and I, again, I do I do expect that there will be. Um, that it will be useful to discuss a drastically different straw man than the compartment proposal um, in order to uh, in order to to, to uh, address concerns that are that are brought up by I mean we, we've had conversations with Michael Hunter about the compartment API uh, where Michael proposed that we have an inside out version of this um, uh, which which matched my design intuition going in but I think that I'm I'm convinced that compartment at least is useful um, because it gives us a a, um, a beachhead for further host virtualization hooks um, that the counter proposal would not. Um, but there might be a middle ground between those two things that's that's more uh, um, more amenable. Um, and of course, Gus Kaplan has a proposal that more closely resembles V8's API. 
or pardon, more closely, in, more closely resembles the VM module as implemented by Node, which itself closely cl resembles the V8 API, which closely represent, uh, closely resembles the TC39 specification as written. Um, and the, there, there will probably be a contingent that wants uh, whatever module loader API gets added to the language to closely resemble that. Um, and, and that might put pressure on the proposal. There's also oh. counter pressure there. Um, th in the last modules working group meeting for Node, we explicitly said we don't like the current VM API uh, <laughs> because it's too hard to reasonably use. And so people were literally copy pasting the source code of our module loader to make it usable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. is a serious issue with it. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we'll have support on the counter side too. That's especially given that the VM module is a better foundation for realms than it is for compartments um, and, and doesn't give you all of the things that we need. All right, uh, I'm going to stop the recording.